Okay. It's very useful at night because it can see these things emitted at night, unlike visible. So the clouds are always there. And you'll all often see this on television or on the internet. You can see the infrared loops. And those are really useful. All right. The cloud top temperature can help estimate the depth of the cloud or the strength of the uplifted air. It kind of implies if you have a really cold cloud top, and you know that there's low clouds under it as well, then that cloud had to be lifted all the way from down low, all the way up to these very cold regions. And that indicates a very strong lifting mechanism, which could last for a long time like it did this week. Very efficient rainmaker. Or it could be the top of a thunderstorm, and it's just one thunderstorm, but that thing's got a really cold cloud top. That means it's a really deep, tall storm. So those are some things to look for. Sometimes it can mask or enhance surface features depending on temperature differences. Okay, I'll show you that. Sometimes low clouds are about the same temperature as the ground, so they all look the same, so you can't tell. But there's other, other kinds of imagery we can use and have available in our office to be able to tell the difference. Yes, sir? Does the Doppler radar make in the infrared day and night or just night? Satellite uses the infrared all the time, 24 hours. Doppler radar is another instrument we use to detect, and we're not going to talk about it directly today. It's another instrument we use to send out energy, reflect off of targets in the atmosphere, and come back. It hits everything. Airplanes, birds, pollen, rain, cloud drops. Airplanes, we have algorithms to take out because we don't want to know where the airplanes are. The FAA takes out rain <laughs> and uses our radar to look at rain, but they want to see where the airplanes are. Airplanes reflect a lot of energy back, and we don't want to see that. We'll overwhelm the instrument. But we can use the, actually clouds of mosquitoes are great because they move with the wind, and we can tell which way it's going. We can actually see birds going out in the morning to feed and coming back at night to roost at the lakes, especially. But there's a lot of information on that on the internet. Okay, this is a loop of infrared satellite. Now you can get different color schemes. And I'll tell you why I've chosen this one. But the default scheme would be something like completely white to completely black, and every shade in between, all the grays. And features don't show up as well to my, I'm getting old, OK? To some of you, not to all of you. <laughs> yeah, I hope I make it that far. <laughs> Maybe I'll get ambushed on the way to the exhibit. My eyes can't pick out the gray shades very well. So I use this, this to pick out lots of details in the clouds. And I've trained myself to understand the differences. And I'm going to show you some of those now. OK. This is toward the end of the rain event into the next day. As you can see, because the clouds are here over northeast Tennessee, southwest Virginia. But then the higher clouds start moving out. Here's the scale. This is very warm. To very cold, okay? So cloud tops in this reddish to pinkish becoming white range are extremely cold cloud tops, which means they got lifted a long ways and are probably a very good lifting mechanism to produce rainfall. And let's go back to the beginning here and watch what happens. Starts out with these cold cloud tops right over the area. And as it moves out, the clouds are warming here, actually, and the weather's improving under. It's still cloudy. But it quit raining. It doesn't rain all the time. It took about a day, though, for the rain to wind down finally. I can't tell, looking at this, if it's raining here. I can only tell there's clouds. So you can't just look at satellite and go, well, look, it's covered in clouds. How come they can't forecast rain? It's not that easy. <laughs> if it were, they wouldn't pay me. OK? And they, so. There's more to it. We have all kinds of data we have to look at. But this is a good start. And typically, this is what I look at when I walk in for my shift. I have a shift Monday. I don't work forecast shifts all the time, but I do have one Monday. And one thing I'll do is look at satellite immediately to kind of get a picture of where I'm at. Where are the clouds? Where are the not clouds? Where is there lift? Where is there descent? Where are the jet streams? And then I start looking at more data. Well, I want you to go follow this back. See how these cloud tops are actually growing because they're turning more pinkish. 
So they're actually being lifted even more as they move off to the northeast. Look at this line of clouds. Remember how they stopped at the Mexican coast down here? They don't really stop at the Mexican coast, do they? It looks like a line of them extends back over Mexico into the Pacific and there's an area here of high clouds, maybe some showers under them, but that's the, the eastern Pacific in the tropics and it's extremely moist. Jeez, it's as far south as the Caribbean. So there's a lot of moisture to be had just west of southern Mexico. So it looks like on the infrared, which you couldn't see on the visible, that it's picking up all this moisture and transporting it up right into East Tennessee. Oh, now that makes a difference. That's something to, that's something to pay attention to because the tropical moisture source is not here. It looks like it's actually out here. Even though there's a broken line of clouds, all the air is moving this way by evidence of the clouds moving that direction. <laughs> so it's transporting moisture into our area. Okay. Is that that jet stream you were talking about? Let's talk about that for a sec. If you look at this line of thick clouds here, you'll see little tiny cloud elements that are moving a little bit quicker. They're not, like right in there, they're not real obvious, but that's an indication of a jet streak. We call it a jet streak. It's the kind of the fastest part. Here's the big jet stream moving along, and it gets faster as you go into the middle of it. In the middle is a jet streak. It, is, it really moves. You might have 70... 70 to 80 miles an hour wind in general out here on the outsides of the jet stream and that center part could be moving 100 to 120. Coming in off the Pacific Ocean into Washington State, there's nothing over the ocean to hinder the wind, right? No terrain. Sometimes they get up around 200, 250 miles an hour jet streaks. And I, you know, we talk about blowing down trees. They talk about blowing down square miles of trees. In the Olympic Mountains, for instance, just <laughs> over they go. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is, do, we have any, do I have any sense of the transport of foreign material, basically, from other parts of the world in, in the winds into our area? Yes and no. And let me, I'm going to put you off for just a second until we get to the next loop. Okay, there, there's an answer to that, and I think I know part of it. Okay? So hold on one second. I want to talk about these, because remember, the satellite is looking at the temperatures of what, what it sees. So cold temperatures means generally high. Slightly warmer temperatures means generally lower. But look at the ground here, there's no clouds here. Okay, remember, very cold, then these greenish, yellowish things up into green is a little bit warmer. Then you get into the kind of bluish and you're, you're still cold. These are temperatures in Celsius, which zero is freezing and that's right about there, okay? So that'd be 32 Fahrenheit, this blue color. Clear down to the Gulf Coast, you're looking at blue ground. Okay, that's what the satellite sees, which indicates that it's freezing in South Texas. Well, it doesn't freeze there a lot, but it is January, so it's cold. Look at this. We're going to talk about that in a second, but look at this line right there. It moves that direction. You see that? Cold air moving that direction. That was during the nighttime. There was a cold front, and it was cold air moving southeastward. And so you can see it in the infrared imagery. Now, during the day, the sun comes up and starts heating the ground where it can, where there's no clouds. Okay, there's that cold front moving through. Sunrise about now. Boom. All this warms up dramatically. Did you see that? It turns purple, which is clear up in here, which is up in the 60s. So the sun is heating the ground and the satellite picks up on that. Now look at Mexico. Mexico actually gets pretty chilly at night. It's got a lot of high terrain. But watch it heat up when the sun comes up. Bam. You're talking about 70s and 80s down in here. So it's dramatic on the infrared. And that's why we love having it, because during the night or day, we can see what's going on. 
Okay, there's a couple other things that are really interesting I want to point out. Remember that snow field out here? It's kind of getting masked. The clouds and the snow field are about the same temperature. But the clouds move and the snow doesn't. 